Hey everybody, welcome back. So we're going to talk about communicating assessment results today. And last week we talked about selecting, administering, and scoring tests. And today we're going to talk about communicating those results. But just communicating comes in this much bigger context. It's not just about the formal assessment of like you give somebody the GAD7 or the MMPI or whatever the test you're doing is and then explaining what those numbers mean. A lot of the textbook and a lot of this class is focusing on that stuff, but there's this much larger context too in terms of when you're talking to people about the results of your assessment, remember our assessments are not just these formal tools, but it's our understanding of what needs to be talked about, whether you're uh, ex explaining a diagnosis or performing a court-ordered evaluation, Sometimes we're changing the way we talk depending on certain clients or we're explaining something about the process of counseling. So communication is a much bigger, broader topic than just about talking about the test and its results. So we're going to try. It's a little bit complicated to do it, but I think it's important to kind of keep that large umbrella here and focus on not just explaining test results, but explaining assessment at large, all of those different pieces. It's going to be confusing. It can be overwhelming to people too, but we'll get some practice throughout the class and the assignments and uh, specifically the kind of work that you're going to be doing because that's an important consideration that we've been kind of touching on as we go here that later on, we're, we're providing the foundation about all these different things to think about during assessment. But once you start seeing clients, depending on the kind of work you're doing, that's going to really change the way you do this stuff. Some of you might be a private practice therapist and you're seeing only, uh, I don't know, like you're working in Hollywood, seeing rich celebrities. So you're going to talk about things a lot differently than if you're seeing, if you're working in, you know, urban Chicago and, and just doing like substance use evaluations or, I don't know, parenting evaluations here in Montana. It's just a different clientele. So, um, and a different process in terms of like where in the system your mental health services are being used, something like that. So um, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples, but some of you are going to be like, oh my gosh, there's so much to consider. But keep in mind that you're going to focus on a small subset of a population to start out. And then as you get more experience and the years go by, you're seeing other kinds of people that might change a little bit. So um, just keep that in mind as we go here too, because I don't want to overwhelm you. But again, I want to make sure we, we kind of keep this large umbrella so I can speak to as many of you going in different directions as possible. So let's talk generally just about a few considerations. So one of the things we get to consider is who are you, are you communicating in writing or verbally? In the class, we're going to get some practice writing a report and, there I'll, and you're going to tell me about a specific client that you have. And there I'm going to say, here's some things to consider in terms of what you're writing. If you're writing to insurance companies, they literally don't want to hear a person's background story and they shouldn't hear because it's not really appropriate for an insurance agent to know what the client's circumstances are. All they care about is symptoms. What's the symptom? What's the diagnosis? And what's the treatment plan to treat that specific diagnosis? That's all they care about. Uh, and so don't you don't want to write like client details, anything beyond their symptomology and diagnostics and what the treatment plan is. And there's this very specific way to do that. Um, if you're communicating in writing to a court system, they're going to want to know something different. Like, for example, if somebody is being sent to you for parenting support because they're going through a divorce and it's contentious and what I don't know, it's just an example. Uh, well, that's a bad example because that doesn't really happen that often. But if somebody is uh, trying to get custody of their children and the court said, we took away custody of the children because of your unfitness for parenting, so we want you to get an evaluation done and seek parenting support classes, and then they look back to you to say, are they ready? Are they ready again to have their kids back or something like that? That's a different kind of writing because you're not writing just symptoms and diagnoses. You're writing about parental fitness, and that's a whole different thing. So... Um, th those are just two examples of communicating in writing. Uh, and by the way, your supervisor will help you figure that piece out. Whenever I talk to supervisors, they're like, why don't they teach you this stuff in school? And I'm like, okay, well, here are my excuses. It's hard, <laughs> which is not really an excuse. Uh, but there is not enough time to explain all the different places that people go and, and counseling jobs that people have. 
Uh, so I'll just give you little snippet examples and say later your supervisors will help you with this. So if they tell you like your professors don't know what they're doing, yeah, maybe sometimes. But also there's real reasons why we can't give you specifics because uh, you guys are doing lots of different things. I'll give you another wildly different example. So in my field of rehabilitation counseling, uh, it's very common for people to want to know, like in a forensic case, this is kind of my background. Somebody just had a car accident and they're trying to understand the disability and whether this person can continue employment. Because if, let's say, a, another driver hit this person and now they can't work or they have to reduce their income level because they can't do the same work that they used to, then part of the insurance compensation for what they call damages includes what's the reduction in pay that this person can't uh, can't earn anymore. And that's part of the pay insurance payout to that person as a result of this accident. So what they want to know is they want to know how is this disability going to affect their employability? That's a whole different thing than just diagnostics and symptoms and that kind of thing, right? So uh, what do you write about? Well, that's the challenge here is are you doing this in writing or are you doing it verbally? Okay, now put the writing thing aside for a second. Now let's talk about communicating verbally. When we're talking about verbal communication, we could be talking about, uh, for example, the client comes in self-referred, I'm a private practice therapist working with people with mental health issues of whatever kind. And let's just keep it simple. Someone comes in and says, I'm experiencing just a lot of stress in my life and my job is just not working that well and my relationships are struggling and I just I just feel sick all the time and I just I don't sleep well and you're thinking oh I'm I'm I bet they're probably either anxious or depressed because that just is a common thing right and this person says I just want to know if there's something really going on now this can happen in lots of different ways one you might say here's the here's a little test let's test for anxiety Yep, it looks like you have it. It's not just you being crazy. This is a legitimate medical condition. So are you? is it because you're making bad choices or you're not morally equipped to handle the stressors of life or whatever? No, it's because you're experiencing a medical condition, right? So the way in which you talk about that might change. Now, here's another example. What if somebody comes in with their wife and says, I don't know what all this counseling stuff is. Counselors are just a bunch of wounded healers just trying to fix themselves and they can't get life figured out. So now they have to try and convince other people of their problems, right? That's a thing that some people believe. Uh, and in some cases is actually real. If you look around at your peers, it's not as often as you think, but uh, we all have stuff, right? How we do that is what we get to practice. But that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but with that person, when you're communicating some sort of results about what do I think is going on, I might actually believe that this person could really benefit from some, some therapeutic help uh, because the wife says they're being mean and rude and they're just grumpy all the time and they're hard to work with. Well, that sometimes is true. But if I tell that to a husband in the first session and I'm like, well, the reason you're here is because you're grumpy and mean, that's not really going to help the situation, right? So I might want to build some rapport and say, well, I'm not sure why you're here yet, but that's what we get to learn together. And he's going to be like, well, you're, what do we pay you for? You're supposed to know the answers. And you're like, well, I'm coming to understand the answers and I'll learn them. And when I, tell, when I find them out, I'll, I'll talk to you about them. But I'm going to hold off just yet because I don't want to uh, say anything that's going to um, be inaccurate. This is just an example of how you might talk to somebody like that. But the point is that, you know, if you're communicating verbally, sometimes you want to be very direct. Sometimes you want to beat around the bush a little bit because relationship is key. If people want your information, it's a different scenario than whether they, they're not ready to hear yet, right? So, okay, there's a lot to unpack there, but we're going to keep moving on here just for the sake of time. Number two says, who are you communicating to? If I'm talking to a judge that's going to change the the kind of knowledge that I can expect that they would have. It's going to contain, contain, excuse me, it's going to change the way that uh, the, you know, like the vocabulary level, maybe. If I'm talking to a child, that's going to be a whole lot different. I might not use words like depression. I might say, do you feel sad, right? So there's lots of different uh, language choices that we can use depending on who we're talking to. Again, lots to unpack there, but I'm not going to go too deep into that. What you can know, though, is that uh, depend 
there's all kinds of different scenarios depending on the kind of professionals you're talking to or depending on the nature of the clients. And that's going to change all of this, like how do you talk, okay? So that's what takes a whole bunch of time to get really good at and get practiced at. But just know for now that you have permission to not just do it one way. I imagine a lot of you, uh, depending on where you are in the program, this might change a little bit. But by and large, most of you are like, how do I think and talk like a counselor? And you're not thinking about how do I adapt that to fit these all, all these different scenarios, kids, adults, uh, judges, clients, whatever. That's a lot to be thinking about outside of you. And many of you are probably thinking at this point of like, how do I just use the words of counseling? And what kind of things do counselors say that sound counselory, right? We all know the the stereotypes of like, well, how does that make you feel? And that's, you can say that if you want to, but there's all kinds of different ways to talk like a counselor to clients and then talk like a counselor to insurance companies and that kind of thing. So you're probably focused on how do you do that stuff right now for, uh, in your way. And eventually you'll be switching to like, I am comfortable with the way that I do it in my style. And I know what counselors talk about. Now I need to fit that and adapt it differently for other people. Um, so this is, in some ways, this is foreshadowing for a lot of you, um, which is part of what makes this overwhelming and difficult. Okay, but let's move on. So communicating performance is part of the ongoing assessment process, not just something that happens at the end. Okay, what I mean by that is, remember earlier when we talked about the assessment process, it's not something that just happens at the very beginning that you say like, okay, this is our first time meeting. Let's fill up these papers. Let's do an interview. Tell me about your family history, whatever. And boom, at the end of 50 minutes or whatever, I'm going to tell you what I think about you. And that's just going to be it. An assessment over. Well, the assessment process is something that continually happens. I'm constantly learning about my clients, taking in new information. And at any point, if there's new information that makes me want to change my mind, I can do that, right? It's not like it just happens at any at some particular special moment. Now, if we were to cut up the counseling process and uh, provide these sort of like teachable objectives, we, we split it up that way. Take in information, develop a treatment plan, work on those goals, and eventually terminate. I mean, that's a typical sort of standardized progression, but it doesn't always happen that way. And in a more fluid way, we're always going to be taking in new information, okay? But let's, let's break this down a little bit. So starting with uh, setting expectations or informed consent, we're going to be doing that throughout the process. Now, we're all going to learn how to do our informed consent speech at the very beginning, but even at the end of the first day, one of the things that I like to do after my first session when I'm doing mental health counseling with people is to say at the very beginning, one of my expectations for this is I want you to leave with a clear understanding of what this is going to be like and what, what we're going to work on next time and what our goals are, even if it's just sort of loose goals. And by the end of the session, what I say is, okay, do you feel like you have a good sense of who I am and what, what it's going to be like to work with me, especially if they're new clients and they've never been to counseling before? Even if they have, I want them to know, like, if, you, if at the end of the first session you have a sense that I'm weird and you don't like me and it's not really going to work, then that's good. We can know that. And if you do say, like, yeah, it feels comfortable, I think I'm willing to come back, that's fine if they want to come back, but I just want them to know what they're getting. That's kind of the point. And so I'm, I'm sort of helping set those expectations of if you know what to expect from me and also what we're going to be working on and talking about, that's an ongoing process. Even in session five, it's, well, we thought we were talking about this, but now we've kind of transitioned to this other area. Are we good with that? Um, is this what you expected from counseling or is this kind of off base? That's, a, that's an ongoing fluid process. Uh, what do the results mean specifically? Now, this might, I think this is generally talking about uh, like an assessment, the, a formal assessment for diagnostic purposes or something like that. Um, again, somebody might express some symptoms now and then come up with some other later. Here's, a, here's an example of what I mean by that. Take this person that, uh, with anxiety that I just talked about. They come in and say, my relationships are strained, work is hard. And I'm just, I don't feel good. Like my tummy hurts and whatever. Then you're like, okay, this is consistent with, I don't know, just the symptoms of anxiety. However, as you get to know a little bit more about a person and they start talking about their relationships, you learn a little bit about their early attachments and how 
uh, you know, the things learned in childhood, just to use a very vague uh, description, things learned in childhood like coping strategies and defense mechanisms are not, are not working now, and they're using them, but their relationships are strained, and they have a lot of stress and worry about their relationships because of it, whether it's work or home or whatever. And so as you go through, the results of your assessment move from how do we just reduce symptomology to how do we go back and repair some of those early attachment injuries, to use some counselor terms. Um, so that's kind of an example of, remember, the performance doesn't just happen at the end. It's fluid and it changes. And as we learn more about people, uh, we want to tell them what the results mean specifically. Well, the results of my deeper assessment are that people learn strategies early in life that don't work later on in life sometimes. And when we do that, I want you to know that we're going to talk about the way you interacted, the process of your interactions with your parents or siblings or whatever it was, and how those show up later in life. So um, again, lots to unpack there, but we'll just kind of keep moving for now. Uh, number three here, what do the results mean for the person, their life, their treatment, etc.? One of the important things to communicate to people, it kind of relates to expectations, but you want people to know how many sessions might this take? Is this an, uh, uh, an ongoing thing that might take years to sort of uh, talk about, learn about your relationship patterns, and then make some changes in your life that uh, make meaningful differences in the way you develop new relationships or repair old ones, something like that? That might be a long process. Um, other times people come in and they're like, I have to do six sessions of court-appointed therapy. Uh, and you're like, okay, well, what do these results mean for you? Then here's what I expect when you show up. You Sometimes you just need to kind of come through, go through the process. Other times you might have to say, the judge isn't going to buy it if you just show up and sit there silently and kind of pout the whole time with your arms crossed. So I want to engage with you a little bit. And here's what that might look like. So uh, what does that mean for a person? They can't just show up. You got to show up and, and do a certain kind of thing or act a certain way. Same thing with class. When we set expectations in class, sometimes we say, "What are the, you know, uh, we're, we're doing this ongoing assessment of you and your ability to do counseling, but if we don't actually get to see you ever and we never get to hear you and you do your papers, but they're like last minute and we just can't, you know, get a good read on you, that doesn't really help you. So what does that mean for your life? We just can't know you. That just doesn't help you at all, right? So that's kind of just an example. Another part to this is not just about like um, length of treatment, but risk level. So if, if clients come in, what is, what is uh, I don't know, one week they come in, they're depressed. The next week they come in, they're manic. I'm thinking bipolar. Well, that changes the way that I might uh, consider like the level of risk. One week, the level of risk might be suicide. The other week, the level of risk might be just doing a wild damage to their relationships or their bank accounts or their physical health or something like that. So level of risk and level of severity uh, is an ongoing thing that might change as well, but communicating that is kind of a pretty important part of the process. Uh, number four, the using language people understand. I think we've already kind of implied that, but I'll just say it outright here too, that there isn't really one right way to do this. Lots of people have opinions on what the right way is of, of, of communicating. If you're talking to a scientist who's really good at formal assessment language and you're like, you mess up how you explain standard deviation or you say like, you're talking about a correlation and you say, well, it's like one thing causes another. And they're like, oh, but correlation doesn't cause, is, isn't causation. And you know, like they're gonna cringe at that and say that's scientifically inaccurate, that doesn't count. And you're like, yeah, but it's kind of okay in explaining it to other people because even though it isn't perfect, they get that language and they understand it. And so going into the details of correlation and causation, it's just not gonna help people, right? That's why I took, tried to take special care in communicating this stuff to you. We went through this stat stuff so fast. And that's why I said, I want you to get a general understanding of how to apply this clinically. I don't need you to know the scientific, precise explanations of why all this stuff is happening. You can do that if you want to go to a doctoral program or watch more videos on YouTube or whatever you want. Um, but that just wasn't my goal here. And so some people might disagree with that. That's okay with me. I'm all right with that. Um, 
Another example is uh, when we give our informed consent speeches, there's the legal language about what is constitutes an exception to confidentiality. For example, um, everything we say is going to be in confidence except uh, risk of harm to self or others, uh, risk of harm to vulnerable adults or children or the elderly. Like there are those circumstances that you'll learn about HIPAA compliance and all that kind of stuff. However, uh, when I'm talking to younger people or people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities specifically, I'm oftentimes saying things like, if you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else, then we got to bring in some help because uh, we'll talk about that for sure uh, before we go talking to other people. But there are certain circumstances in which we're going to want some other people's help here because I can't help you if you're going to hurt somebody outside of this office. So, and that's completely appropriate to, to change the way you're talking depending on developmental level or you know circumstantial concept, context about what people understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, uh, the last point here relates a lot more to like the, if you're learning about formalized assessments and you wanna explain things like standard deviations and what that means in terms of cognitive development or delays or whatever, like how you explain the science, that's what we're talking about here. So there's some examples of uh, talking more about statistics on page 394 of our book. So we're going to kind of breeze past that one here. Okay, so there are... Uh, one of the things we'll get some more practice on is considering who are the referral sources and who are we talking to in terms of other professionals, maybe the clients themselves too. But what we're talking about here specifically is when it comes to communicating with clients, what are the barriers within the client counselor relationship that make uh, communicating results challenging and difficult? These first two, they can be different if we want to split hairs, but let's just take them together and kind of understand acceptance and readiness. And we'll, we'll just say it this way. In terms of a person's readiness to accept results, and by results, I mean the way you as a counselor understand what's going on in their life. In some cases, in many, if not most cases, you're going to collaborate with the client to say, what's going on here? Here's what I know. Here's what you know. Together, we can come up with an answer that says, yeah, you're, you're feeling clinically depressed. Um, and that's consistent with what you told me, which is like you're sad all the time. And you don't want to get out of bed. and You're gaining weight and sleeping too much. And you feel have suicidal thoughts sometimes. And like that to me says clinical depression that meets all the criteria. And so you you do that together, right? In that case, they're ready for an answer, they're accepting of that diagnosis, and um, you're kind of working through that process together. Sometimes people come in and say, I want to know from your uh, expert experience to know if I uh, if something's going on with me or if I'm just crazy. And you're like, well, that's a, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there too. Um, you're not crazy, there is something going on with you, and it's called bipolar one or I don't know some you know you have a specific social phobia and that's explaining why you're uh, not wanting to leave the house or you stay in the safety of your security bubble something like that um, people can be just generally distrusting of the process remember the husband that I talked about earlier who was just like I don't want to talk about my feelings I don't think anything's wrong I think my wife's just sad all the time and she just needs to like put on her big girl pants and pony up or I don't know what people say in those situations, but people can be distrusting of the process or of counselors. And um, if you think, here's a guy who's experiencing depression, but one of the things we know about men sometimes, and sometimes women too, is that instead of feeling depression like sadness, it comes out as anger. And they're like, I'm just irritable and pissed all the time. And you're like, well, it's depressed. No, I'm not depressed. Depression means sadness. And you're like, well, that's not really what that means. Um, but they don't know that, and they can be distrusting of those answers. So um, that can be a challenge in terms of giving those results. You are depressed. That's the it meets clinical criteria. I just don't like it, right? Um, there's lots of different ways that can come out. This sort of readiness thing. A uh, typical example that most people understand is uh, talking to alcoholics. People who are like, "Yeah, I drink a lot, but it's not my problem. It's their problem." Now, this is a place where uh, understanding about um, readiness of um, stages of change, sorry, understanding about stages of change and how that is conceptualized oftentimes is through the motivational interviewing process. 
if I know a person is at the pre-contemplation stage yet, which is, I don't even see a problem here. I don't know what everybody else is talking about. Yeah, I do drugs. Yeah, I drink. But, you know, it's not hurting anybody. It's just hurting me. So why do I have to do anything about it? And they don't see the, the harm and hurt that it's causing other people. Um, that says a lot about where they are. That's a lot different than somebody that comes in and says, um, I'm kind of at the planning stage, pre-contemplation. Now they're contemplating this problem and they're thinking about it. And now they know there's a problem, but they're planning, okay, like I don't, I'm not ready to work on it yet because I don't even know what to do. So I got to set some plans. That's a whole different readiness level. So conceptualizing how a person is willing to accept results that you need to communicate through that process can be really helpful uh, in terms of identifying where they are and what, what can help them get to that next place. Um, by the way, that's a that this is a challenging thing for new counselors to be to be working out. So, if you're like, okay, yeah, I want to learn how to do that, learn those stages of change, just memorize them right away. And as you look at other people and say, okay, I can identify the problem here, and I can identify the stage that you're at. What you can be thinking of next is how do I facilitate getting somebody from contemplation to planning or pre-contemplation to contemplation, something like that. We often hear. Families come in and say, they don't want to acknowledge there's anything going on. How do I help them do that? And they're like, well, I've told him a million times that he's just depressed and he doesn't believe me. And you're like, okay, yeah, but that's not actually working right. Like, that's not going to help. <laughs> so um, that's where we can come in with our experience of facilitating those kind of interventions. Okay, let's move on. Nobody wants to hear bad news, right? I mean, some people are okay with it, uh, but generally speaking, experiencing negative results is not something that we want. And here's just a kind of a extreme but not uncommon example. Somebody wants to get their kids back and you have to do an assessment and you're talking about, you know, parenting fitness and they're like, I'm really working my hardest. I use once in a while, but you know, I just want my kids back cuz I love them so much and and you might have to say if you're using actively, you're not ready to have your kids back. And they're like, but I love them so much, and I've been doing so good during my visitations. And, you know, that, those are challenging situations to hear that. So uh, in, there's lots of situations where people don't want to hear this. Here's a completely different scenario from my rehab world. Um, somebody thinks they've been treated unfairly or discriminated against because they wanted to get a job and they, they were denied employment. And they say, it's because I have a disability and they're discriminating against me and they need to do things differently. And in some cases, that's absolutely true. In other cases, it's not that they're discriminating, but the conditions under which they have to, uh, the rules that employers have to follow do not constitute uh, them doing anything wrong per se. Is it unfair? Does the system need to change? Maybe. But the way definitions are made of what is a disability, if this person doesn't qualify, then they don't get that support, even though the way they understand their disability or their identity might be different. Here's an example. I could beat around the bush a little bit because it's complicated. People apply for Social Security benefits, and they say, I have a medical condition. I went to the doctor, and, that, and I have this disability, and uh, you know, I want to get, I can't get a job. However, what they don't know is that they could get a job if they could work through uh, finding the right employer and have the right accommodations. And so they're applying for Social Security and they're not going to qualify for it And because a job exists that they actually could do. But they're like, I, don't, I can't do that job. They just don't know it yet. So those are situations in which uh, people don't want to hear that they can't have benefits. Uh, but if they did hear that, like, but there's a better answer here and there's another way to work through the process through vocational rehabilitation, then uh, that's kind of a way to get around this. Okay, keep moving though. Um, flat profiles. This is a tricky one without showing, throwing an example, and I kind of want to, but we'll get to this when we talk about career uh, career assessment. We'll do this one called the ONET Interest Profiler. Some of you maybe have heard of this. Some of you, most of you probably haven't. But when you're looking into what does a person want to do with their life you can use an interest profiler to start identifying areas that people like to do versus things they just don't like to do. And, and I have a lot to say about these tests uh, because I think they're wonderful and exceptional if they're used correctly. Um, but some of you maybe have taken these and you're like, yeah, I know that I want to be a counselor because I like people and I'm, you know, I, I just, 
I don't know, I just know that. I'm good at this stuff. A lot of you wrote these kind of things in your applications to the program. Um, what constitutes a good counselor is oftentimes things like people who are really good at investigative tasks, like solving pro mental problems, like somebody has symptoms, how do we work them out of it, that kind of thing. Um, some of you who maybe have this sort of like creativity, artistic talent, uh, not everybody does, but for people that have that kind of stuff, sometimes you can think outside the box and say, well, you know, we have these treatments, but here's what it's going to look like specifically in your life. And that takes a little bit of creativity to come up with uh, treatment goals and stuff like that. Other people aren't that creative, but they just have this really good systematic way of working through issues. So um, in terms of using an interest profiler, it can help identify not just like the specific jobs, but the kind of person you are and the kind of work that you do. Now, one of the things that can happen in relation to flat profiles is some of you, you know exactly, I love people, I hate working outside, I hate uh, counting numbers, I don't like uh, business people trying to sell people on ideas, I'm about collaboration and working with people, and client, I believe clients are empowered to make their own decisions. In those cases, you have very specific interests, and so it's clear, like, you should go in this path. However, uh, others of you are like, but I kind of like all these things. I like uh, sort of convincing people of certain things, like to, you know, to to use this intervention or to buy this car or whatever. Some of you like to, um, I don't know. I like to, I like Excel sheets and I like fiddling with numbers. You know, I'm not that good at it, but it's fun. I enjoy it. You know, or I like building with my hands. And these are all sort of different. Uh, skills that would put you in different job categories or something like that. I'll explain what that means later. But when that happens, you end up with a flat profile. You're interested in just about everything in a very similar way, in which case it doesn't really point you in a specific direction. And this happens in mental health uh, assessment too. When somebody comes across as like, they don't really peak in terms of depression or anxiety or somatic symptoms or anything like this, but they might have like just a, you know, like a, a symptom progression that just sort of seems like it's really hard to identify what is actually going on and um, it's hard it's really hard to explain this without showing you a specific example so I'm gonna hold off I think on explaining that but if you are looking at assessment reports you'll run into this kind of thing and it'll you'll say like well how do you even tell then if you can't interpret strengths and weaknesses or symptoms for a symptom profile because the results seem like they're not valid but yet they actually are. So that's just another challenge for a later day. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, just to reorient, what are problem areas in terms of assessment feedback with clients? Motivation and attitude. Um, this, these kind of are similar to acceptance and readiness, but not wanting to see results they might feel are imminent. Um, this think the whole thing is stupid. I kind of already talked about that with the uh, acceptance and readiness thing, but you know, Somebody might know there's something going on, but they just don't want to call it that thing. So here's an example. Um, if I if I know that I um, that I have these moments of uh, binging at nighttime after a stressful day, and then I throw up and I feel better, and so I go to bed or something like that, it's like I know that that there's something there, but I'm not ready to call it an eating disorder because that sounds big and scary. And so people can be at this place where you're like, well, you know, this is problematic. And you're like, no, 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 it's not a big deal. It's, you know, not hurting anybody. It's just, it's sort of this weird thing that I do, but I just, you know, nah, I don't see it as being a problem. So again, the reason when I talked about change stages of change as it relates to motivational interviewing is because the motivational interviewing process deals a lot with, well, how do I motivate a person to see that this is a problem? And then next after that is how do I motivate them to say, now that you see you have a problem, how do we develop some way of getting out of that and then uh, envisioning a life without those conditions or that those behaviors and how much better that could be, something like that. Then we can set up a plan, then we can work on the plan, all that kind of stuff. So motivation and attitude uh, are just challenging because you want to increase motivation, but if people aren't ready to accept or uh, acknowledge a condition or, or work on a plan or actually do the work that it takes, um, that can be challenging. Okay, uh, 
Last one here is specifically related to talking to parents about like a specific formalized assessment results. So I'll let you look on uh, page 399 uh, about that. They can give you more of that language to talk about the science and the, and the statistics and that kind of stuff. Um, and then this the second bullet point. Remember when we talked about confidence intervals a few weeks ago? That's kind of what we're talking about here. This is one way you can say, well, this is actually a little bit different. But if you say, you know, I don't like the results, I want to try again, uh, that's where you can talk about confidence intervals. What if they say, I think you're full of it and I want to go see somebody else? Well, it's it's really probably a good idea to say, I mean, there's two scenarios here. One, you could say, well, um, you can see somebody else, but I feel really confident in the results that we have here. And so I think these are sound. I think this is just the result that we're going to get and the ones that we have to deal with. In terms of like school assessments, sometimes they can't afford to have other assessments done or they they can't afford, they don't like this result, they don't like the system, they think the school sucks, but this is kind of all we have. And that takes a little sensitivity. Uh, other cases, uh, it's totally normal for a person to say, for a person to want to be like, well, I appreciate you, and I just, but I just need to check this out with somebody else. Um, and you, you can be like, well, that's, that's totally fine. You know, I don't want, it's better if we have a more good minds working on this issue so we can all come together and get it right, you know? So uh, how you do that specifically is something that you'll want to practice uh, as you get out into seeing clients and stuff. Okay. Um, I know I spent a lot of time on those, those few slides, but there's just so much packed in there that I wanted to spend that extra time. But now I'm going to speed up a little bit here, okay? Um, when we write assessment reports, we're now out of talking to clients specifically. And before that, we talked about communicating with other professionals. We're kind of going to get back into that communicating with other professionals because oftentimes reporting uh, is that process of in written form. How do we then send this to an insurance company or send this back to the judge or put it documented in writing so that it can be transferred so that you don't have to verbally say this over and over and over again to people? Um, Written communication is an important part of this process. So um, we're going to get some practice with this. There's four purposes for writing a report in writing, and I've given you just a couple of them there informally, but one of them is describing the results. So you want to describe the results to the client because the client is really the priority here. What's the outcome? What happened? What was the process we went through? Uh, what was the outcome and then what does that mean for you? We talked about like setting expectations, that kind of stuff earlier, but that's kind of part of that. Record and interpret the client's results performance on instruments. So specifically, if you gave any specific tools, what happened there? We've already had some practice with the, uh, the Beck's depression inventory and the GAD7 and we're exploring some uh, PTSD results and that kind of thing. That's what we're talking about here. It's like specifically as it relates to a, a, a test. What, what does that mean? Communicating assessment results to the referral source. Now we're not talking about the client, we're talking about the referral source. So here's the specific result on this test. Here's what it means for the client. And here's what it means for what the referral source wants to know. Again, there's a lot going on there, but we'll get some practice with that. Um, and then lastly, it's great to know what the issue is, but Probably the most important thing that people really want to know is, okay, great, now what do I do about that? So what does future care look like? How does that affect a treatment plan? What are the goals? What are the risk levels? What's the timeline? How much money is this going to cost? Those kind of things. Um, you are very, very, very unlikely going to put how much money is this going to cost. There are some circumstances which you do that, but we're not going to talk about those. Um, you're, But mostly you're just saying like, how long is this going to take and what is it going to look like? That's the result here. Now, again, one of the things we're going to practice is how do we, there's a lot to write here and there's a lot to consider. So how do we uh, assess the quality of a written report? I'm going to help you with that because likely you guys, when you're starting your final projects, you're not going to know like what's a good report, what's a bad report? How do, am I writing too much or too little? Am I using good words or bad words or, you know, that kind of stuff. And you're just going to kind of, Give it a shot, and I'm going to be giving you feedback throughout the process, but this is going to be an ongoing thing you're going to be practicing for quite a while. But here are some pointers. One of them is the use of jargon. Earlier when I said you're learning now to think and talk like a counselor, but if you talk to clients about their, um, what's a good example? If you say uh, you're experiencing some encopresis, 
and they're going to be like, uh, wait a minute, I don't know what that means. That sounds like Latin. You're like, you're having poopy problems. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I, okay, I know what that means. You know what I mean? Uh, <clears throat> so using that counseling jargon, it, it's some cases can be important and other cases not. And this is where you get to just get some practice and experience. If you're talking to other medical professionals, excuse me, uh, specifically people with medical training, like doctors who learn a little bit of Latin, talking about encopresis might be completely appropriate. However, if you're talking to, I don't know, um, uh, like a judge or a, a parent or something like that, uh, using those overly technical terms are maybe not that helpful. However, here's the, here's the drawback. If you don't use the technical terms sometimes and learn that professional language related to the people that you're speaking to, you might risk uh, not being taken seriously. So that's one of the reasons why we spend a bunch of time in our program on medical terminology, because we want you to have that terminology in your back pocket so that you can sit with a bunch of doctors, psychologists, uh, lawyers, or whoever it is, and say, yeah, you guys have this impression that counselors are only masters trained, so we don't, don't know as much and we're not as good. But uh, if you can show them, like, no, no, I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about. We speak the same language, but I don't say that to clients. I'm not going to be like, you know, like, uh, this is called encopresis, and what it means is blah, 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 blah. So there are situations where being technical is important. There are situations where being technical is super unhelpful and to be avoided. But learning both is going to make you better. So um, just keep that in mind as you're going through this. Okay, poorly defined terms. Um, if you use uh, if you use a word and you don't explain it, that's not really helpful, right? Uh, so you have to. Sometimes it's helpful to define terms. However, if you're overly defining things and people already know what you're talking about, they're going to be like, "Ugh, just get to the point." You know what I mean? That's a hard hard line to walk, and it's hard balance to set. Um, but there is there is kind of a way to successfully do that. Um, abbreviations not described. If you say CBT, a lot of the world is going to understand what CBT means. A lot of the world is also not going to understand what that means. Even if you spell it out, cognitive behavioral therapy, sometimes people will get that. Other times they won't. Sometimes you have to say uh, a form of therapy which focuses on cognitions and behaviors is called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And so sometimes you spell it out. Sometimes you can just say, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you can just use the acronyms, but be careful with those. And by, by be careful, uh, I don't mean like it's going to hurt somebody. I mean, you're just going to not be able to successfully communicate as well. And there are consequences of that, but they're not high risk ones, but pay attention to it. Um, poor or illogical explanations of results. I think that one's self-explanatory, uh, but it just, again, is going to take some practice. Vague recommendations. Now here's, here's a, I just went to a training a little bit ago with uh, some clinical supervisors and they were like, when you're developing treatment plans and establishing, uh, like, establishing what, what kind of tests you're doing, I'll give you an example here in a second. When you're doing that, you want to be as vague as possible because the actual things that you do in counseling are not necessarily what you write on papers. And here's what I mean by that. This is, this is one of those things that people are going to be like, whoa, you can't say that, but hang with me for just a second. If I write uh, that client was seen for an evaluation and had a symptom profile consistent with major depressive disorder, okay, that's that's the diagnosis, um, and then you list all the symptoms, and then you say uh, we'll engage in cognitive behavioral therapy for six weeks with reevaluation period at the end, okay. What does cognitive behavioral therapy actually look like in these circumstances? Well, it might look like uh, either sitting in a room and talking to a person about their uh, life experiences. It might mean uh, an in-home uh, working on something else. I don't know, like, you know, working with a family in-home. Some of you are experiencing, or not experiencing, some of you are working in school settings. So it might look a whole bunch of different ways, but uh, using vague terminology in some cases allows you the flexibility to, to perform your jobs in a way that other people don't necessarily need to know the specifics of. So it's always this hard balance. There are situations in where being vague is okay. However, what we're practicing now at this stage is being very specific and being very um, being able to use the language in a very specific way. So one of the things that happens is 
we'll spell all your recommend and not in this class so much but we'll spell out like what does the assessment result mean what is the family history and we're going to like extend that process out so we can get as much detail in as we can partly that's so i can understand how well you're understanding these things um, and i can give you a grade based on what you need to learn and where you're growing and that kind of stuff um but you might get out later and someone will say like don't write that don't write that because then they're going to ask questions and they're going to pick on this and then it's going to cause more issues. So don't write that. And you're going to be like, well, is that ethically appropriate? Is this okay? In some cases, it's not okay. In some cases, it is. And I can't unpack that anymore for you right now. Um, but it just sort of highlights the challenge. There are places where it's totally appropriate to be vague, to give yourself some wiggle room uh, to do treatment in the way you do treatment. Another example of that is not CBT. If you say, we'll engage in mindfulness exercises. Well, mindfulness exercises can mean a whole bunch of different things. That could mean uh, progressive relaxation exercises in a group setting, or that could mean just becoming aware of the, the emotions you're experiencing within uh, your relationships or something like that. It's a lot of different things, but you don't want to be like, well, client will experience progressive relaxation only to find out next week that they're not going to they're not going to be able to schedule in that group and now they can only do the thing in your office. Then you're like, well, now I'm being inaccurate and the insurance company is going to ding me on it. So those are cases where it's appropriate to be kind of vague. Um, other cases are where it's not appropriate. It's like if you say we'll engage in CBT counseling only because all people love the evidence based whatever of CBT counseling, and then you go do something that is not evidence based, like uh, we're going to try, I don't know, we're going to do a weekend retreat and take mushrooms and see if anything happens. Now, that whole psychedelic assisted therapy is, is we're now getting more evidence and more understanding, and we're understanding the risks and benefits. But before you go into things that, that you don't understand the risks and benefits, that's not appropriate to just say you're doing one thing and, and taking a huge risk in another place. So uh, for now, there's a, there's a lot more, but for now, just understand that this one is one of those where uh, you might hear somebody walk it back later on and be like, no, 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 be vague, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, we, I'll try and help you be specific here in class. Poor organization, I'm helping you a lot with that one in terms of like how do you highlight information in a way that, that uh, communicates the important stuff right away um, and what makes logical sense. That's something that we're working on right now. We can, uh, well, I'll help with that immediately. Emphasis on numbers rather than explanations. I think that one probably speaks for itself. If you just write a bunch of numbers, especially if you don't understand them, but you don't say, how does this number apply to a real life scenario, then it's not really that helpful. And we talked about when we were going through stats, we, I kind of emphasized a few times, this stuff actually, yeah, they're numbers. And yeah, we're sort of splitting a person's mind up into these different concepts and whatever. But they apply to real life scenarios and they mean real things to real people. And now we're saying, yeah, and then say how it applies. Uh, thinking about, okay, this person has a depression level of 17 on the, on the Beck's depression inventory, but then you have to say, what does this mean for you? What are these symptoms that this person's experiencing? Uh, how do they show up specifically in this person's life? And then what are the treatments to work on that specific thing from that number? Because that number says something about severity. And then if you explain, this is what's going to be good for this person to help them, then you're kind of closing the loop, that logical loop. And then uh, excessive use of computerized results. Uh, don't copy and paste. <laughs> That's basically the moral of the story there. We talked about that a bunch in class, so I'll just I'll skip over that one for now. Uh, how much do we got left? Oh, I got to hurry up, probably. This list uh, was at another place in the book, and it's largely the same thing that I just talked about. So I'm going to skip over most of these. Um, we are talked about jargon and abbreviation. Uh, refer to yourself in the third person. I have mixed feelings about that because, again, that depends on who you're talking to. But when I said... Pretend you're talking to a professional audience that you want to look good in front of, you want to look competent and capable. Um, talking to your, about yourself as the counselor, um, the, you know, the rehabilitationist, the, the therapist, whatever, that can kind of give you what a lot of people consider a level of professionalism. Um, but again, in depending on this different scenarios, you might use yourself in first person, like say, I, the counselor, um, or you might even use your name, like 
if there's multiple people working on case management or medical services or whatever, you might say, Aaron said. So there's lots of different ways to do that. I'm not convinced that being third person and and referring to yourself as the counselor all the time is always the best scenario. All of you guys are going to have different ways of doing that depending on your background, training, and practices and stuff. So, you know, just do what works and uh, think of, just think about it in the back of your mind. Sometimes I'll give you uh, some advice about doing it a different way. Um, but take into account that there might be a reason for it or it might just be a matter of style. I'll try to differentiate whether I think there's a real benefit to doing a different way and explain that to you. Um, otherwise, it's just style and that's okay. So anyway, um, let's see what else. Oh, number four, avoid using needless words and phrases. If you can get your message across in one sentence or 10 words or whatever, if you're adding more language, it's probably just obfuscating or making unclear what you're trying to get out. Um, when I verbally talk to people, like you guys, you can, you'll see this now all the time <laughs> now that I'm saying this, but sometimes I mumble and ramble and I say things in multiple ways and it's partially intentional because I'm teaching and I want to give you different examples and different ways of saying it, but it's also me just sort of like talking a lot and, uh, you know, I work on being more concise and efficient with my words, but sometimes I just go like blah, 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 blah. And so that's something I'm always working on is just avoiding the unnecessary, something like that. Um, avoid redundancies is kind of the same thing. Uh, okay, number six. This one can be kind of helpful for people that are not strong writers. When, we, when you uh, were in high school and they were teaching you how to write an essay, they said, okay, we're going to do one introduction paragraph, a thesis statement, two to three sentences, a conclusion statement. Then you're going to do your, uh, your three supporting paragraphs and a conclusion. And each one of the supporting paragraphs has a thesis statement, through two to three sentences, and then a conclusion or transition sentence. And like they broke it down to that level of detail. What we're talking about here is at the very first line, if we're going to break down this process and have it really formalized and make it easy for you to practice, the very first line is say what you need to say and then explain below. Because if you start explaining and you weave this narrative story and then say, and the conclusion is, that can be really hard for people to digest, especially when you're doing technical writing like this. In other words, let's say you're gonna, you just did the, um, you did the Beck's depression inventory and here's the number and here's what that number means. And then you're gonna leave a little narrative explanation instead of saying like, Clients showed symptoms of blah, 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 and that is consistent with depression. They have to go through all the symptoms in order to get to the conclusion, which is they meet clinical criteria for depression. Instead, what we're saying here is that make that declarative statement right above. Client shows consistency with major depressive disorder based on this symptom list, and then you list them out below. So start with the, start with the final answer and then use supporting paragraphs below. Because as you're going through reading other people's par other people's papers and you're looking at other medical records and stuff, the way we scan papers, and nobody's going to read in detail. Some cases, it's read in excruciating detail. But 99% of the time, other professionals are just going to like skim through and sort of see results and then say, okay, what's the what's the meat of what I want to get out of this? Uh, cut all the fat. So helping people get to the most important and then allow them to go into detail uh, below. That's what we're talking about here. Um, write background information and observations in past tense. That's kind of splitting hairs, but if you say somebody lived in a certain town, uh, don't say they live in a certain town because that's misleading. They're not living there anymore. They lived there before. And so looking at tense, that can be something, it seems obvious, but I make these mistakes all the time. It drives me and anybody who's editing my work crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and I'll try and catch them for you if I see them. But uh, it's just a good thing to practice. Um, write assessment results in present tense. Uh, that one is actually harder than it sounds like because um, sometimes we want to say, well, they took the test a few hours ago, and I'm writing my report the next day, so I want to write them in past tense because that's what it was at the time. However, you always want to write, even if it's an hour, a day, or a week later when you're doing your documenting, you want to write it in present tense. That's kind of an important one, and people mess that one up from time to time. Uh, information irrelevant to the purposes for the assessment generally should not be included. Okay, You're going to get a whole bunch more practice, hopefully, uh, about this later. This is when I was saying, 
if you're writing about like the client's story and t- telling personal details about them in the way that you report to other people, for the purposes of this class, it's okay, and we're going to do that because I want to understand how you can bring in all of the context of the client, give assessment results, all that kind of stuff. We're bundling it all together. However, some of that stuff is protected health information that you don't need to share with other people. And if you're, if this happens to you, it's not going to happen to everybody. Uh, but if you write this big report and it has all these personal details in there, including details about sexual traumas or details about other family members who aren't the client, and then you send that in for forensic analysis or for forensic report to an attorney, and that goes into public record, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of stuff about there for the public to see about this client, and that's not okay. So uh, that's why we write things like this about, you know, if you don't need to have it in there, err on the side of it's not worth it. However, for this class, ignore that. Just pretend I didn't say that. But later on, um, be as minimal as possible with your client information. Tell people only the bare essentials of what they need to know. That's the kind of the general rule here. Um, capitalized test titles. I don't know why they pick on that one to, to say here, but that's important. Um, pay attention to punctuation, capitalization, spelling, and grammar. Yes, edit your work. It makes you look lazy and sloppy if you don't. I make mistakes like this all the time. You'll see them in class on my syllabi and my presentations, all that kind of stuff. I don't like it that I'm not good at it, but I'm not good at it. So uh, I have to compensate by having other people look at my work or going over it a couple times, and I try to catch those things, but I'm just not good at it. So, uh, and it makes me look like a dummy. Just kidding. You might think so, or you might be like, no, no, Aaron, it's fine. We all make mistakes. <laughs> I still think it makes you look less professional, but okay. Um, I got to hurry here because I want to keep keep this close to an hour. Uh, report sections. These are very general categories, but basically in any kind of report, whether it's an employment report, whether it's a mental health counseling report, whether it's a, a, um, a an uh, alcohol assessment, or what. All of these general categories show up. Now there's lots of other additional categories or you might call them different things, but if you're doing a full and thorough and complete assessment, you're probably gonna wanna know about just about all of this in almost any counseling context, okay? So for our final paper, I'll give you a template with these titles on it, but just know that um, in some, ca- in some cases, it's going to look a lot different. So for those of you doing uh, uh, LAC work or license addiction counseling work right now, uh, might be called something different in your state. But if you're doing that kind of work right now, you might have uh, ASAM criteria embedded in there. It might, within the ASAM, the six ASAM dimensions, you'll have all this stuff embedded, but it falls into different categories. So uh, it just looks different, but it's all there. Um, some of you might have uh, you might have a lot more medical information, so you can add to these categories if you want. But generally speaking, this is just sort of like template language here. So I'll give you more about that when we do our projects. Um, I think I've kind of already mentioned this throughout, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to skim over this. But who are you talking to? Counselors, medical doctors, attorneys, etc. One of the things that's important to note here is that just because a person is a medical doctor does not mean that they understand how trauma affects a person psychologically. Lots of people think they do. Lots of uh, lay clients even think they understand what depression is, what anxiety is, what trauma means. However, with our specific knowledge, it oftentimes means something different. And it's pretty helpful to, to ask people what they think they know and to not assume they either know something or they don't. Because if you get it wrong, it's it just doesn't really work that well. If you assume another counselor knows exactly what you mean when you say solution-focused therapy, not everybody really does. Like we all use the words solution-focused or motivational interviewing or CBT or existential therapy, and yet it's still kind of vague in a lot of our heads, right? So what you can do is you say, what do you know about this? Or what does it mean to you? Or how do you understand it? Because here's how I understand it. So it's a good idea just not to make those assumptions because I know many of you have heard this probably, but making an assumption makes an ass out of you and me. See that? See that how that works? There's the ASS, you and me <laughs> out of the word. So uh, it, in other words, that's that's a little bit crude. But what it does is it makes us both look silly when we're not speaking the same language or on the same page about what things mean. So 
uh, just it's it can be uh, so easy to try and assume that people know that, especially when we're self-conscious about what we know and we're like, I need to sound really smart even though I don't really feel that smart. So I'm going to use these big words, assuming that they know what they mean, even if I feel like I don't. Um, it just doesn't work. So if you say, here's what I understand this to mean, what do you think it means? It helps us really align. It helps me get smarter because then I learn from other people too. So be be honest with yourself. And also be honest with what other people can or cannot know or do or do not know, something like that. Um, again, think about what information people need to know, privilege communication and privacy. That word privilege communication, we haven't talked about that, I don't think. Um, but basically what that means is if, a, if somebody goes into an attorney and says, hey, will you represent me in a case? I just, uh, I'm in trouble. And I murdered somebody, but I need you to get me off. That attorney, uh, that conversation they have about, did you actually kill this person? If they said yes, that's considered privileged communication because the attorney doesn't need to say that because their job is literally to, to convince everybody else otherwise. Their job is to say, this person couldn't have killed anybody, even though I know the difference that, that they did do it. But that is so private and so secret because the process of you know legal defense requires that that it's called privileged communication because it gives the attorney special privileges to not disclose certain information we as counselors everything that we talk about with clients is considered privileged communication except in certain circumstances whether there's risk to harm herself or others vulnerable adults and children etc or if there's a subpoena. That's part of that informed consent process that you have to tell clients about. And when those subpoenas happen, there's certain things that are considered privileged communications and certain things that aren't. And that's where it's a whole nother thing that we're not gonna get into today. But um, uh, pay attention to that, learn that, ask about it later. What can I say and what can I not say? And when I said earlier, err on the side of everything is private, don't give it out. Do that until someone tells you, yeah, but you have to give this to the judge. Like, it's just, you have to do that. <laughs> so um, there's a lot more to know there about how you help protect your clients from things becoming public because sometimes judges say, we need to know this in order to find do our jobs. And you're like, yeah, but this is going to do more harm than good. So I'm going to keep this private with all due respect to your honor <laughs> or something like that. Um, uh must get releases of information. Yes, we all know that. I I wish I could spend another hour just saying that over and over again because make sure that clients give you permission to talk about things, even if even if you uh, I don't know, just get trained on this. Ask about it later. I won't say anything more about it now, but it's so so important. Uh, communication with public. This is something that was added in the book, and it's going to relate to some of you in your work, but not everybody. But there are certain circumstances, like if you're working at a school, for instance, and I don't know, like you have to send home a, a, a newsletter about how the kids are doing. And you're like, well, I know the kids are really struggling, but how I communicate that to, uh, to the general public, even if it's just an email to parents that could get out to general public, how you do that is a very sensitive thing. And so what things do you say? It's like a PR problem, you know? What things do you say? What do you not say? Um, there's a lot more to talk about with doing that. You're probably not going to do that kind of stuff until you've been in a job for a while. But some of you might, it's very real to go into a community with doesn't have enough services and you find yourself in a nonprofit and very quickly, even maybe before you're licensed, you get promoted to director and all of a sudden you're in a role where you have to do these kind of things and you're like, uh... I'm not feeling very confident yet about my ability to communicate with public about things that are going on. Um, so a lot to say there again. I feel like a broken record saying that stuff. But okay, I went a little over an hour. I apologize, but we are done for today. So thanks for hanging out with me. Um, there's just so much that is hard about this communication uh, in writing and verbally and all that kind of stuff. And what I'll leave you with is something I said in the very beginning and over and over again, because I want you to hear this. It's so important that you are starting to learn about counseling or you're through a program, but even if you're almost done with the program, you're still just starting. And if you feel like there's a lot to learn here, it's because there is. And I would rather risk overwhelming you at the forefront here and give you a bunch more information about the context. 
I'd rather you feel a little bit overwhelmed right now and maybe a little bit more prepared about what you can know later than not giving you enough. So um, know that if you're like stressed out and overwhelmed and oh my gosh, there's so much to learn, I, I'm sorry for that, uh, but I do it for a very specific reason. But just know that you are in a good place and there's always time to learn more. Um, I'm still learning about a lot of the stuff that I talked about today. Uh, so uh, you're probably in a very good place and I'm sorry for stressing you out. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it there. Talk to you guys in the next one. See ya.